So I'm going to introduce the Pablo Carota. Hello. So when I wrote my first professional uh, program around 1995, uh, it was uh, this Java applet, a lot of graphics. It, it really sucked in so many ways. Uh, it's, uh, I couldn't even find a working copy on the internet to demo today. This gives you a hint at, as to how successful it wasn't. And um, it, it, mainly it was really, really slow, unusable. Uh, so, I did what a developer does. I optimized it, right? Here is how we optimized stuff in 1995. It was essentially a two steps process. Step one was checking the stupid turbo button. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm actually surprised that so many people know what a turbo button is. <laughs> because for, for those who don't, it wasn't actually a button that made your computer faster, of course. It made it slower because the idea was that computers were evolving so fast that today's computers would make yesterday's applications, games in particular, unusable. So you slowed down the computer by pushing that snack, and sometimes you forgot to depress it, and uh, yeah, it happened. Uh, if this didn't work, then there was another thing that you could do. Just sit and wait. And within six months to one year, your application would run just fine. Because you would have a new computer that was so much faster than the previous one that problem solved. It was just crazy how fast they evolved. Uh, why, why is that? Well, more slow, of course, right? You heard it here first. Or rather, you don't. So, the number of transistors on a chip will double roughly every couple of years. So you have this nice logarithmic scale here, and uh, that's the number of transistors. More transistors, more computation. More computation, more speed. And at the same time, clock speed was progressing pretty much in the same exponential way, and um, uh, Heat dispersion would go down, energy required would go down. In general, no, heat dispersion wouldn't. Okay, long story short, they got faster really, really reliably. Every six to one year, you could see the difference, a huge difference. Then, around 2005, somebody wrote this, which many of you probably read already, uh, if you didn't do that. It's a great article. It says, essentially, it's over. Did you enjoy just sitting on your hands and waiting for computers to get faster and your software goes faster? Not anymore, OK? Uh, we, this is a dead end. We can't make computers faster like that anymore. And this article proved a little bit ahead of its time, but at, at least when it comes to transistor sides. But when it comes to other things, like, for example, clock speed, it was spot on. You can see how it suddenly levels there. This computer that I have here uh, has pretty much the same clock speed as my previous computer. This is the first time this happens in my entire lifetime. And now it's happening with transistors. This is a very recent article from Ars Technica about the fact that the semiconductor industry is essentially throwing the towel on this. They are like, OK, we can't make this happen anymore. Okay, so why is that the case? Well, one thing is that transistors are really tiny now, like tiny. Um, so I did some back of the napkin calculation. This is a human hair, okay? Uh, so I went to the reception and I asked uh, how large this room is. I got way more information than I asked for. So now I guess I need to organize a conference, otherwise they will be very disappointed. And uh, uh, roughly, if you take this hair and you make it as large as this room, then you would be able to see a transistor. It would be about one millimeter. You would have to squint. Just. To make this clear, at this size, if you squint real hard, you could see your own DNA double helix. Of course, you couldn't see it because we are way below the wavelength of visible light, but you catch my drift. So they're tiny. 
And some people say, okay, now we're getting to the point where we're reaching the physical limits and we can't make them smaller because of quantum effects and da da da. Uh, which is actually not really the case. We can still make them maybe one order of magnitude smaller before uh, um, the laws of physics start to catch up on us. But actually, matter of fact, what is uh, the, our stumbling block right now is even more powerful than physics. An even more overwhelming force, which, uh, hint, I'm not talking about love. Here, what we have is uh, the evil counterpart to Moore's law, uh, which is called sometimes Black's law, which says the money you need to build a transistor plant roughly doubles every four years. So right now, I, I have a note here, it's $14 billion to build such a plant, to build state-of-the-art transistors. They're getting too expensive, okay? Maybe the next generation of transistors will be smaller, but you wouldn't be able to afford it. As simple as that. So we need to do something else. We need some other way to make computers faster. Why? I mean, you might say, hey, wait a minute, I, I don't need faster CPUs, right? Maybe I just need more CPUs. Uh, if we have big data, we can map or use the hell out of it. Just uh, give me more computers and, uh, you know, and I mean, WhatsApp is fast enough. Tinder is fast enough. What else do you need? Well, there are actually, as it happens, a few use cases for faster computers, mainly artificial intelligence. Now, of course, everybody is amazed by what we are doing with artificial intelligence. A computer just wiped the floor with a Go Grandmaster, and we have seen Google's robot strolling in the snow, right? But those are the easy things. Sorry to break it up on you. Pattern matching rules, uh, constrained environments, those are easy. If you look at stuff like navigating unconstrained environments, for example, there is a competition that is called the DARPA Robotic Challenge, where robots are supposed to do stuff simulating a rescue operation, driving to a building, entering the building, doing stuff in there. And, well, some robots could actually drive to the building. When it came to entering the building, it was kind of a disaster. This, this is the painful result of this. They, they couldn't even open the door sometimes. It's, we will never be enslaved by such incompetence. It, 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 it didn't even try. Oh, look at this. May vodka and circus don't match. OK, so uh, it, it's painful. Now, I, I know that because I showed you these, they will kill me first, probably. But for now, uh, as somebody said there, if you're worried about the Terminator, just close the damn door. They, uh, they, they just don't stand a chance, right? <laughs> so, so, we have a problem here, okay? We need faster computers, and we don't have the technology. And we don't know how to build the technology. So, uh, this is what I'm going to talk about for a while. How can we build computers that are just different? And uh, possibly could approach the problem from an entirely different point of view. And maybe one day be faster than our current transistor-based computers. So. I need to have a short introduction that is very basic. How do computers work? Of course, they don't, but when they do, um, this, this might be uh, even, uh, maybe offensive to a few of you. This is really basic stuff, and I'm also simplifying a few things, in particular the electrical side of things, to the point where I'm actually giving incorrect information. But it's just a model, right? So if you know this, hold on for five minutes. This is a transistor, it's a, a switch. What happens is that if I have current there, current is not going anywhere because the switch is open. But if I apply current there, I close the switch and it gets through. Again, if you know about electronics, I know I'm confusing current and tension, I'm making a mess. But this is the basic idea of a transistor, the way that I see it as a computer, as a software person, okay? 
What do we do with this tank? Well, for example, we can put two of these in a line. And we can wire that part up there, and we can connect this other part here to mass. And what happens now if we apply current there is that current has nowhere to go because the circuit is open, so it will go there, right? Hmm? And if I close one switch or the other by applying current there, well, it, nothing is changing. The circuit is still open here. So we still get current there at the output. But if I take both inputs here and I apply current to both of them, then I close the circuit so current now has a better place to go, and there it goes. And I don't have current there. Is that clear? That's how computers work. This thing, if you build a little table that says input output, you get this, right? The only way not to have current on the outside is to have current on both inputs. Okay? Now let's replace current with true and no current with false. You get a nice truth table. And this has become what we call a logic gate, which is a device that essentially applies logic to the input and comes up with an output based on specific rules. In particular, this is something that's called an end. Once I have an end, what can I do with it? Well, one thing that I can do with an end is to connect the inputs like that. Hmm? And once I do that, let's look back at the table here. Uh, those two middle lines, central lines in the table, cannot happen anymore, right? I wire the inputs together, so I can remove them. And actually, it's not two inputs, it's just one input, so I can just collapse the first two columns. So this is what I get. This is something that's called a knot. What can I do with a knot? Well, I can take a couple of them, connect them to an end like this, and now look at what is happening. What if I want to have no current there? To do that, I need to have current to both inputs, right? You remember the end. So I need to have, whoops. I hope I didn't spoil it for you. I need to have this. Mm? which means that I need to have the opposite at the inputs there, okay? So that's the only way to get false at the output. If I have any other combination of input, then I get true. So this is false. Any other combination, I get true. Can you recognize this logic gate? Okay, I just made an OR. And so on and so forth. I have a whole zoo of these things. I can create more of them, assemble them, and uh, assemble them into a CPU. I can also build memory with this stuff. So that's how computers work, essentially. And why did I go through this? Because m the point I wanted to make is it's not about the transistors. We don't care about the transistors. We care about the gates. Those are the components. So it's about the gates. And if we can build gates with anything that is not a transistor, we're all set, right? So the problem becomes, how can we build gates with other stuff? And indeed, we can build gates with a lot of different things. For example, we can build gates with domino pieces. If they fall, it's a true. They don't fall, it's a false. So an OR would look like this. This is easy, right? Can you design me an end with domino pieces? That's harder. Should I spoil it for you? Or do you want to spend a wonderfully geeky afternoon design these things, maybe you, uh, I, I would actually do it, but okay, if you don't want to have it spoiled, close your eyes. <sighs> this thing here is inhibiting this line here, because it's kicking out these two pieces, right? So for this to happen, to be true, you need not to inhibit these, this must be false which means that here you have the same mechanism, this must be true. 
And of course, that one must be true as well, because that's where we're coming from. And there is some sensitivity to timing and stuff like that, but it's an end, it works. It's right, for real. And you can assemble it and create a computer out of this stuff. I do not recommend it. Uh, but <laughs> people did it, of course, because it can be done. It's, um, well, it, it, it's not the, the fastest computer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or the most reliable, for that matter. In this case, for example, it's doing it for a calculation wrong, but oh, well, it kind of works, okay? So yeah, you can do that. Um, you can also build the logic gates with stuff that is even more crazy. For example, there is a real research project in Japan which is publishing real uh, papers in scientific magazines that is building logic gates with crabs. Um, I think is soldier crabs have a very reliable swarming uh, behavior. They behave pretty much the same way every time. So if you build a gate like this, you put the crabs in here and in there, okay, and then you encourage them to move by uh, projecting shadow over it, over them. Okay, they don't like shadow because they associate it with the predators overhead, so they will start moving. And then if you have crabs from both sides, the two bunches uh, of crabs will uh, clash together and uh, kind of even out. Uh, they will proceed in a direction that is essentially the vector sum of the directions of the two original groups of crabs. So you get an end gate with crabs. I'm not, uh, again, I'm not advocating building computers out of stressed out crabs or, <laughs> uh, it's just, the, the notion is we don't need our sisters, we can come up with completely different ideas. So, for example, if we want our computers to be faster and smaller, we're using electrons right now. Eh? What's faster and smaller than an electron? A photon, yeah. Yeah, we can make a computer out of light, and why not? I mean, we are already using light to transmit information, right? Especially when it's long distances, we need to move a lot of information. So there is a lot of research there. This is a picture from last year. Uh, IBM built the first fully photonic chip it works with light. Uh, it's, uh, thing is, there are a lot of uh, technical difficulties there, making it work correctly. Uh, light stuff is very sensitive, it's uh, easy to get it wrong. It, uh, there is a lot of uh, energy dispersion when you convert light to electricity and back, so actually nobody knows whether we will be able to actually build computers that beat the current computers there. Another thing that we can use is a chemistry. This is a fun video. It's something, it's like uh, uh, accelerated 10 times, I believe. It's something called the Belus of Zapotinsky reaction. Uh, and it's very nice, apart from the fact that if you stare at it for like five minutes, you get stoned. There is, all, uh, there, uh, there is also the interesting property that while most chemical reactions just, you know, happen, second law of thermodynamics, and then they, they stop happening. This one is cyclical. It keeps uh, going through waves for a very long time, which means that it's sustained, and you can actually build logic gates out of it. And people are doing that. And also, I cannot avoid talking about the stuff that everybody considers cool these days and uh, seems to have a lot of promise and Google and IBM and Microsoft are, are spending a boatload of money trying to make it happen, which is uh, uh, quantum computing. Quantum computing is nice for a number of reasons. One is that the computers actually look awesome. It's a, they, they look how Victorian it is. It's like yeah, pure steampunk stuff. And, um, and on top of that, uh, another interesting quality is that I cannot really talk about them because I don't understand them at all. 
and probably neither do you because we are not evolved to understand this stuff. You can, if, you are, uh, uh, if you are very good at physics, you can probably prove it works, but understanding the fact that a bit can be either zero or one or both, uh, depending on uh, what's happening to quanta. And as soon as you look at it, it will freeze in one of the two states. You know, Schrodinger's cat and stuff like that. The, uh, yeah, no, you're not going to understand that. It's totally counterintuitive. What is happening is that because they have this fuzziness of states, there are algorithms that you can implement with a quantum computer that are uh, really, really fast. Assuming we can make a quantum computer work. And this is where it's getting funny because there are companies who are bragging about actually building working quantum computers and uh, the debate goes like, it's a quantum computer, and other people go like, no, it's not, it's just a regular computer. Look at it. The moment I look at it, it's not quantum anymore. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you think I'm joking. This is literally what is happening. <laughs> it's just so crazy. So essentially, the only way to understand whether they are quantum computers or not is to check whether there are a few like a million times faster than a regular computer. But first, you have to make them faster, which means we have to get there, and we are working in the dark. And it's, uh, it's totally, totally weird. In, actually, I'm cheating a little here, because I sneakily went away from what I was telling you about gates and so on. Here, we are not talking about regular logic <coughs> gates anymore. This is not a regular Boolean logic anymore. Here we are talking about a different kind of computation altogether. So building computers that are probably not general purpose computers, but they are special purpose computers for specific problems. This is what we are mostly doing with quantum technology. Uh, and when you get into that, then there are a lot of interesting things happening. People using DNA, for example, as a computer, hey, why not? It's small, right? It has memory. It's very good at duplicating information. So you can actually use it to solve algorithms. And there are a few very nice success stories about uh, using these to solve classic computer science problems like the traveling salesman and so on and so on. There is a good article on The Economist about how they did it. If you are interested in the process itself, go out and read it. Uh, my personal favorite is this thing. The, uh, uh, now, uh, this is a living thing, of course, OK? It's, uh, uh, it's called the uh, Pfizerian polycephalum, or slime mold. Actually, it's not a mold at all. It's more like a big uh, amoeba, a, a very big one. It's a, a single, very, very big cell with a lot of nuclei. And uh, it's, uh, I'm going to sound like clickbait now. You wouldn't believe what this creature can do. It's just crazy. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's amazing. So what, one thing it does is that when you give it food and it really likes uh, oat flakes for whatever reason, uh, it, uh, it tries to stretch over the, fo the food, to engulf the food, which means that it tries to stretch really thin so that it can uh, um, gather the protoplasmic mass to actually engulf the food. And there are things like this. This is a maze that people are doing. This is a maze filled with one specimen of physarium, and this guy is putting oat flakes on two edges of the, of the maze. Uh, this is uh, sped, uh, speeded up, uh, I think, 10 or 20 times. And uh, you can see the creature engulfing the food and getting thinner otherwise, okay? And it gets to the point where it gets really, really thin and stretching because it's an individual. It's one cell. So it doesn't want to separate, right? And uh, here is how it ends. And uh, uh, this is the interesting part. If you look at this, this is the minimal path through the bait. So, <laughs> the, this is uh, mind-boggling uh, because, well, first of all, from a philosophical standpoint, if an amoeba can solve a maze, okay, it doesn't have a brain or neuron or anything we associate with intelligence, but maybe we should just revise 
what we think intelligence to be here. Uh, maybe we are all very, very complicated amoebas, but that's, uh, uh, think about it tonight. In the meantime, we can use it to solve the traveling salesman problem. Here it's, uh, uh, this is a stop motion movie of Fiserium uh, um, redesigning the US highway system. It's very good at that. <laughs> People are doing so many interesting things with this. Uh, it's also very easy to, you know, uh, to do at home. Uh, there are people who are using Fiserium as a lithographic mask to generate circuits. They work. Uh, if you are interested, to look. There is this site that is uh, essentially a community of scientists and. Amateur uh, specializing in these, and it's full of cool stuff like, of course, Ghostbuster references. I mean, just look at it and uh, uh, look at the discussion. So, using slime molds to simulate gentrification. I, I love this one. But why does Pfizerum like chocolate? Um, I, well, if you have too much spare time. You know. So, these are some of the ways that we are trying to do computation that do not involve the classic transistor-based computers. Uh, some of these are just games. Uh, some of these actually have some promise. They might be the next way we build computers. Uh, don't rule out chemistry. It looks silly, but you never know. Uh, to be a little bit more concrete, now I'm supposed to come up with some predictions about what's going to happen. And uh, because I like to cheat, I will come up with uh, predictions that are mostly obvious because it's stuff that is already happening. So I will try to give you one very short term, one medium term, and one long term prediction. Short term, that's easy. We are seeing it happen now. Functional programming is getting to be a big thing. How is that related to what I said? Well, the thing is, we can't make computers faster right now. So we can only have more computers, which means more parallel programming. And our current languages, in general, suck at parallel programming. I mean, try to do some serious parallel programming with Java or even Ruby. It's, uh, it's all based on shared data and mutexes and it's a huge headache. So we need models that are fit this new parallel world better. This is essentially what that paper that I showed at no, uh, uh, the end of the free lunch said. And uh, you can see this happening all the time. That's why so many of us are looking at Go, Elixir, other programming languages that make it easier for us. Medium term, but also already happening. You know that uh, computer science, computers in general, computer technology is like a huge pendulum and it oscillates like that. And uh, now we are completing one of the biggest oscillations that started when I still hadn't even started being a professional programmer yet, which is uh, the mainframes are back. Yeah. <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> it was the, that guy. Get him out. The thing is, uh, they don't look like mainframes, right? They look like the cloud. But yeah, uh, the, the idea is, if you can't have the processing power you need on your computer, and you need to go out and rent a computer for a big corporation, time sharing on it, that's a mainframe to me. It's a mainframe with a rubber nose. And uh, this might be uh, even more uh, accentuated by technologies such as, I don't know, quantum computers. Will they happen? Nobody knows. But if they do, you don't want to put a quantum computer on your lap 
because it's wrong in so many ways. First of all, your lap would freeze because you need to have uh, to, to operate very close to absolute zero temperatures. And also you will uh, be squeezed because it would probably be really, really big. In other words, you will probably go to Google and say, hey, he, take my money and give me some computation power. So what we are witnessing is a huge shift to the server, as in a server you cannot buy. For the long-term prediction, this is long-term, so it's wrong. Good thing, nobody will remember I made it. Uh, if we keep getting so many specific technologies that match so many specific problems, like for example, hey, okay, we have a combinatorial problem, we can use chemistry. Huh? A general purpose computer just is not fast enough. Uh, then we can expect that these technologies will diverge. So we can expect something like a Cambrian explosion, so to say, of different computing approaches, different ways to do computing. Cambrian explosion has a lot of diversification. What would the programming language look like? if this programming language was built to code uh, chemistry. Somebody is actually designing something like that. DNA. Hmm? What would your next programming language look like if it were designed to control living things? We don't know. We're probably going to specialize. This is long term. It's kind of happening. Uh, it's kind of happening in the way that, for example, now, if you need to do a lot of parallel computation, maybe you're coding your GPU, not your CPU. And it's a different programming model, in a way, right? So, the thing is, this might be a long-term trend, and it might be huge to the point where, I don't know, in a couple, uh, in 20 years from now, maybe, uh, I won't be a developer anymore, I will be a chemical computer developer? Far-fetched, probably not, but you catch my drift. Hmm? <coughs> no idea. Of course, I'm trying. Yeah? It's going to be fun to see what happens, because it's a totally different world from uh, 95, you know, turbo button and stuff. That's it. Thank you. Ada Lovelace, Charles Babbage, respect. <laughs>